A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on our webinar, Understanding Immune Cell-Based Therapy Against Cancer. I'm Dr. Lucas Look, CEO of Landmark Medical Center, and I will be our event moderator for this evening. I'm excited to see so many of us here tonight on a weekday evening as we explore the groundbreaking field of immune cell therapy against cancer. Now, many of you might have heard of the much vaunted CAR T cell therapy, where live immune cells combat cancer with potency and precision. Indeed, immune cell therapies such as CAR T cell therapy are demonstrating tremendous promise in improving the lives of cancer patients and represent remarkable advancements in terms of cancer therapeutics. Over the course of the next hour, we will be sharing on what cell-based immune therapy is all about, the current state of immune cell therapy, as well as possible combination therapies of cell therapy with other therapeutic modalities in terms of cancer therapeutics. I'm confident that today's discussions will be both enlightening and inspiring. And now let me introduce my two esteemed colleagues here with me today, who will be sharing their insights on cellular immunotherapy. We have with us tonight, Dr. Tan Wikiet, Chief Operating Officer of Cytomet Therapeutics, with multiple, multiple publications pertaining to immune cell therapy under his belt. Dr. Tan, please say hello to everybody. And Dr. To Keng Kit, Consultant Hematologist and International Cancer Specialist, as well as Director of Cytomet Therapeutics. Dr. To has been involved in many cutting-edge treatments for hematological cancers throughout his career, and here he stands with us again on the front line of cellular immunotherapeutics. Before we start, some housekeeping reminders, so this will be a smooth and enjoyable experience for all of us tonight. We will have a presentation followed by about 20 minutes of Q&A. Ask questions. We encourage active participation. And if you have questions for our speakers, please type them in the Q&A chat box. We will address this during the Q&A so as not to disrupt the flow of the presentation. If we can't address all questions during that time, our team will strive to follow up afterwards. So please just leave your name and your email as well uh, after your questions. Respectful interaction. We advise everyone to engage in professional and respectful discussions. So please be courteous when asking questions or making comments. We also appreciate diverse perspectives, but uh, we appreciate if the questions and comments are relevant to the topics being discussed tonight. If there are further inquiries, we're happy to take this offline with you. Technical support. If any of you do encounter technical issues during the course of this uh, webinar tonight, please reach out to our support team through the chat and we'll try to assist you as best as we can. This webinar is going to be re recorded and will be available for viewing. So by participating, your consent to be recorded has been sought. Thank you. I'll hand over the floor to Dr. Tan Wikian. Right. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lucas, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule to attend this. So good morning and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are dialing in. And, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit more about understanding immune cell-based cancer therapy. So let's see. Right. So I'm Wikiet, and you know, just for information, this the information that is shared on this presentation is really for educational purposes only, right? So if there is any need for medical advice, you know, please do seek medical advice. And we have two very experienced, uh, you know, clinician that is also on on the panel together with us. Right. So let me dive into cell therapy. So what is cell therapy in general? Cell therapy is quite straightforward in a sense. It consists of three simple steps here. So step one is to obtain the immune cells from patient, or it could be from a donor as well. So you obtain the immune cell from a source, right? And then outside the body, you actually perform the necessary expansion, the modification, all processes outside the body in a controlled environment, you know, typically known as a GMP or good manufacturing practice laboratory. And after that, you actually reinfuse the cells back into the patient 
to elicit an anti-tumor effect. So this seems to be three simple steps, right? But there are a lot of details that are surrounding it, and we will do a deep dive into this uh, in a bit. But before that, you know, to show you better on how exactly this happens in the human body, right? We look at this video that has been taken. So this video is also on our website. And before I start the video, the cells that are circled here in yellow, they are actually our human cologne cancer cells. So actual human cologne cancer cells. And cells that are here, you know, your teardrop shape, you know, your gummy worm shape cells, these are actually activated immune cells, human immune cells. So in the 48 hour time lapse video that you can see, especially in this particular circle here, you can see that when the cancer cells have not been detected by the immune cells, they divide rapidly. You can see here, one become two, so it's here, and one become three, where that is typically that don't happen in the human body. But as the immune cell detect the cancer cell, you start to see them drawing these straight lines. And what happens is that the immune cells are sensing where the cancer cells are, and they home in and they go in for the cube. So you can see that in 48 hours, the cancer cells that have initially been circled here, they actually have all been cleared off. And the rest of this, these are cell debris that will be cleared up by other immune cells that are found in our body. And so this, you know, is just to showcase what actually happened on the cellular level. And this is exactly what happens in the body when we infuse the cells back into the patient to fight the cancer. Right, so let's talk about cellular therapy. And a lot of cellular therapy uses the autologous cell therapy workflow. So when we say autologous, it just means that you must take the starting material from the patient and you only produce the cells back for the patient and it's only personalized or autologous. So as you can imagine, the process is a little bit more complex if you take cells, you expand it, and then you put it back into the patient's own body. Now, because this is personalized, there are certain challenges with this autologous cell therapy workflow. For example, there is long vein to vein time when you draw the blood to reinfusion, so long vein to vein time, because you can only start the manufacturing when the patients come to you. Now, there's logistical challenges because the patient is going to be at the clinical site or the hospital. You, after withdrawal of blood, you will take it to the manufacturing site, which is usually off-site from the hospital. And after the manufacturing, you put it, you transport it back to the clinical site and infuse it back to the patient. Now, because of all this, it is a bespoke therapy. There is a challenge in scaling up and scaling out of this autologous cell therapy, and that drives up the cost significantly. So this is one of the challenge of autologous cell therapy in terms of long wait time, in terms of cost as well. And from a business perspective, it's difficult to scale up and scale out. Therefore, the scientific and the medical community think about the future, you know, and you look into allogenic therapy or off-the-shelf therapy, you call it. So for off-the-shelf therapy, what you do is you take the starting material from a donor, you expand this in the laboratory or in the GMP facility, but when you put it back, you can put it back into many different patients, ideally without matching. So for this, if you are able to do it this way, you will be able to scale up and you will be able to scale out. However, this is not without you know, its own limit uh, challenges to overcome because you would want to try and separate the rejection from the donor's cells against the patient. But 
you want you want to remove that, but you want to retain what we call the anti-cancer effect. So they have to discern very well between not attacking the healthy recipient cells, but attack the cancer. So like I say here, the factors to consider include reducing host rejection, removing graft versus host disease. And a common approach is actually to use gene editing, for example, to remove certain receptors or proteins on the cell surface while keeping an intended anti-cancer effect. But will this increase manufacturing complexity and costs? It depends on what is the approach that you are trying to take. However, allogenic off-the-shelf therapeutic approach is still the future because as you can see here, you take healthy donors, starting material, meaning that they are of higher quality, and you are able to pre-make the therapy so that the patients, when they come to you, they do not wait for a long time, and you will be able to serve many uh, patients at the same time. <clears throat> right. So then let me talk about a new type of, or rather, a lesser known type of T cells that are found in our body, which can be a good candidate for allogenic cell therapy. Now, a little bit of history, the gamma chain of the T cell receptor was actually cloned in 1984, that's 30 plus about 50, 30, 40 years ago, right, which led to the discovery of the gamma delta T cells in 1985. So in our body, all of us have a T cell subset, you know, that protects us from infection. Having said that, there are two classes. There are the alpha beta T cell chain, which constitute about 95% of our T cell population. And we have the gamma delta chain or the gamma delta T cell, which consists of about 1% to 5% of our T cell population. And therefore, the gamma delta T cells themselves are actually a much rarer subset that is found in all of us. Even though they are T cells, as you can see here, they actually perform very different function. If you see here, this is the cells that actually make up our immune system. And you can see that the gamma delta T cells sit actually between the innate immunity that provide very rapid response against invaders and the active immunity that is very slow in response but very targeted. Our normal alpha beta T cell is here, is here, whereby it is, it is involved in the active immunity. But the gamma delta T cells is in between, and one of the key functions, other than it being anti-cancer, is it is that it communicates between the two in it, uh, the two immune systems, so that it helps the other cells to mature as well as to fight the disease. So you start to see very interesting properties of the gamma delta T cells. Here we look into the function. You can see that the gamma delta T cell can directly lyse or destroy stress and infected cells, but they can help B cells to mature and secrete antibody, epithelial cells, which is skin cells for regulation, alpha beta T cell priming, releasing cytokines or signaling factors that help to prime other immune cells as well as to do maturation for dendritic cells. So you can see that they have much more function communicating between multiple sets of cells. And like I say, uh, here you can see other functions such as managing inflammation, wound healing, and chemokine production, and even antigen presentation, which is needed for other immune cells to learn about the enemy at hand. But you can see that it secretes. When I say cytokines, cytokines basically is a signal factors. And you can see that it secretes many different kinds of cytokines 
that actually have multiple functions that manages and help regulate our entire immune system, such as inhibition of tumor growth, control the expansion of T cells, managing other T cells as well. And you can see here, Within the gamma delta T cell family, there are actually you know two main subfamilies. But today, you know, we focus on the gamma delta the, the gamma nine delta two T cells as they are the most abandoned population in the peripheral blood. So a deeper dive into the gamma delta T cells, they have many, many receptors on their surface. So when I say many receptors, you think of it as many different antennas, like TV antennas, that is on the surface of the cells. And when that happens, the each TV antenna can recognize one or more targets. And if you have many of these targets, or rather antennas that you can see here, they can recognize many different types of targets, and thereby can exert a cytotoxic stress Sorry, a cytotoxic effect on the stress of transforming cells via a number of mechanisms or methods. And this sheds light on their function on top of being a potential effector cell to target solid tumors and blood cancers. So that is an introduction about the gamma delta T cells. At the same time, in parallel, in the clinic, people observed very interesting presence whereby the presence of gamma delta T cells actually act as a prognostic marker and predict how well the cancer patient fare. And when they see that there is a high number of gamma delta T cells that are found in the tumor, it is a good prognostic indicator for cancer patients. So in the clinic, you start to see some data whereby this is interesting because the gamma delta T cell seems to confer a protective effect on cancer patients or protective effect so that there is better outcome for cancer patients. Here, you can see that metaphoretic stem cell transplant a key goal is to separate between graft versus leukemia or graft versus cancer and the graft versus bone disease. People started to realize that when the gamma delta T cells are found in higher proportion in the body, it actually plays an important role in immune reconstitution and prolong the remission of the cancer patient while reducing graft versus host disease. You can see that here, and the blue is the general gamma delta T cell population. And you can see that when the gamma delta T cell population is higher, these are the patients that actually fare better. Especially, particularly in the initial days after transplant, on day 28 and day 56, you can see that the gamma delta 2 especially are in a higher proportion and they remain in the highest proportion in the gamma delta T subset throughout one whole year, day 365. And these are the patients that fed very well in terms of the transplant. So here you see data whereby patients with high gamma delta T cell population 56 days post transplant actually have better overall survival and relapse-free survival as compared to patients with low gamma delta T cells. You can see here, this is the high versus this is the low. You can see a significant gap. And these patients are, are followed actually for more than two years. This is 800 days. And you can see a very significant difference in A, which is overall survival, and a very similar trend in uh, progression-free survival. So people start to see that there is beneficial protective effect of the gamma delta T cells post-transplant. And they think that mm, maybe they are onto something with the gamma delta T cells. 
Continuing, you can see that when there is a high gamma delta T cell here versus the low gamma delta T cells, there is lower risk of death from relapse as compared to patients with low gamma delta T cells, as you can see here, where the graph is uh, very well separated. And this is the total gamma delta T cell concentration, and this is the gamma delta T cell concentration over the alpha, beta, and gamma delta combined population. And you can see that the trend is very similar. Again, the patients are followed over two years. What has surprised the clinician also when we observe this patient is that when patients have high gamma delta T cells, they actually have lower graft versus host disease, especially when they are doing hepatoidentical or allogenic transplant of the hematopoietic stem cell. So here you can see that there is very uh, there is a much lower incidence of graft versus host disease. And this means that the gamma delta T cell seems to be able to take the checkboxes whereby they can be anti-cancer, so they exert a cytotoxic anti-cancer effect, but at the same time, they can reduce graft versus host disease, making it a very interesting and ideal potential set of cells you know, for allogenic therapy potentially. Now, at the same time, you, we, the, the researchers actually have found that gamma delta T cells can recognize and kill many types of cancer cells, including hematological malignancies and solid tumors. Here, you can see that it does not attack allogenic B cells, healthy B cells. However, this is uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. There is TALL, there is chronic myogenous leukemia. So these are all the leukemias. Over, over here at this row, you can see pancreatic cancer, colon cancer. Uh, these two are colon cancer. You got ovarian cancer here. Then you can see that the killing of the cells are very good, meaning that they are able to target a broad spectrum of cancer. So this is actually studies that have been done kind of in parallel in terms of time frame, but different from what has been different from the hematopoietic stem cell transplant. We will start to look at using it to target solid tumors, and we can see very interesting lead up from here. Moving on, researchers have used it to run what we call preclinical studies or animal studies here. And you can see that there is significant in vivo killing of the gamma delta T cells against the solid tumor. How you read this chart is like this. You, you start off that there is PBS, which is that's phosphate buffer saline. And these are different subtypes of gamma delta T cells. The color patches here is actually where the cancers are in the body of the mouse. And this is a heat map where blue is lower density, but the cancer cells are present. And you have the red patches where very high density of gamma delta T cells are present. If the, if the mouse are injected with just a line and day zero, you can see that the cells have grown to a higher density at day 72. However, when you injected the animals with gamma delta T cells, you can see significant control in terms of the cancer. So this is the pictorial, and this is basically the flux, which is the light given off, and you can see significant uh, differences. And what it actually translates to is the prolonged survival of groups that have been treated as compared to this dotted line, which is the untreated group. Significant, pro, uh, significant increase in overall survival, 200 days post-infusion. And so this has shown us that it is very possible to potentially use the gamma delta T cells as an anti-cancer tool. 
So in parallel, you can already see what has been observed in the clinic. And at the same time, <clears throat> researchers have also seen or demonstrated the potential efficacy of gamma delta T cells that are in, uh, in the animal. What is natural is that people try to then push the gamma delta T cells into the clinic. Now, the first approach is actually to do in vivo expansion of gamma delta T cells in the patient's body, meaning to use drugs to try to increase the number of gamma delta T cells in the patient, typically through two drugs, which is zolotonic acid and interleukin-2. However, the outcome was less than ideal. You can see that the trial has started as early as 2003, you know, running through to 2022, and the results are, you know, typically lackluster. You have some patients that respond that have what we call stable disease that can stabilize the disease. But unfortunately, many of them have uh, disease progression. So it was less than ideal. And people were scratching their head, why have this happened if we have seen that the gamma delta T cells are supposedly anti-cancer in nature? So that was expansion of the gamma delta T cells in the body. Now, as we start to gain more understanding about the cancer micro uh, tumor environment, they will understand the we have found that there is suppression, uh, there's immune cell suppression or immune system suppression, especially in cancer patients that have very heavy tumor burden. And the activity of the gamma delta T cells could potentially be rescued when they have been expanded outside of the body before putting it back. So a second wave of using gamma delta T cells started, which is to do ex vivo or outside the body, expansion of gamma delta outside the body prior to infusion. And you can see that as early as 2007, you know, continuing throughout the years, there are being multiple trials that are being ran. And they have seen signs of efficacy improvement. You can start to see stable disease, you know, some of that even have respond, very good response. And you can see that the tumor types that you see here are actually not blood disorders, but actually solid tumors, which is, which is very interesting. So outside the body expansion, by rescuing the activity of the cells, you may be able to elicit better efficacy. As we march into the future, because these cells are still taken from the patient, and in the very initial few slides, we have touched on the fact that when you are, when you get cells or starting material from the patient themselves, there may be impact of the quality of the immune cells because the patients themselves are usually very heavily pretreated with the likes of chemotherapy or radiation before giving their blood for cellular therapy. So as we realize the potential of the gamma delta T cells can be used in an allogenic setting, now people start to investigate allogenic use taken from healthy unrelated donor. You can see that here throughout that studies have been ran and you can see much, much better response of the gamma delta of the gamma delta T cell therapy combined with potential new formulation as well as approach for cell expansion you could you can potentially drastically drive up the scale of production and by doing so you can also lower the cost of production and potentially making it more affordable for cancer patients. So you can see that the progression of how gamma delta T cells develop 
you know, from observations in the clinic, observations in the lab, as well as new formulation approach moving into the allogenic aspect of things. So we can see that the journey so far for gamma delta T cells it started off with observe, it started off with the discovery of gamma delta T cells and the observation from hematopoietic stem cell transplant, whereby high gamma delta T cells are associated with better patient outcomes. At the same time, it is also observed by other groups that the anti-cancer effect of gamma delta T cells in vitro and in vivo is very good. So this combined together, people move into move the gamma delta T cells into the clinic. However, the first wave of autologous in vivo expansion of gamma delta T cells, meaning to expand the cells in the patient's body, unfortunately, it was lackluster. But we all persevered and we tried to expand the gamma delta T cells outside the body instead, and we had better results. So right now, as we move into the allogenic space, the use of allogenic cells obtained from healthy donor, gamma delta T cells in the clinic, we are getting much better results. With increased advancement in expansion method, you know, we potentially see the gamma delta T cells as an allogenic of the cell off the shelf cancer immunotherapy. So this is the cell that we're talking about, the soldier right, that carries the gun. Now then, what gun or what target? How can we even better the gamma delta T cells? Are we able to educate it? Are we able to equip it with better rec recognition or better killing capabilities? And that is where we segue into, you know, just a small part on CAR T cell. So we have heard of, we have all heard of CAR T cells. We know that it is an advanced therapy of using patient's blood or donor's blood, equipping it with it's called a chimeric antigen receptor or an antenna that enables it to recognize very specifically the cancer and then you can kill it. So there's a lot of talk about it, but we let me just share a little bit more on what is CAR T cells, how exactly is it designed, and what it actually means. So a CAR T cell, a C C A R CAR, actually stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So the chimeric antigen receptor, why is it called chimeric antigen receptor? We look at a photo here, which is a chimera. Chimera actually consists of lion's body, goat's head, and actually a snake tail. And in other mythologies, there may be dragon wings, and etc. etc. Now the chimera is actually man-made, so it is a mix and match between domains or animals to select for the properties that we want. For chimera emission receptor or car. Is a mix and match between three naturally occurring domains that are found in our body. But we pick each one of them to have specific properties that we want. So that's chimeric, is a mix and match. Antigen, we select for the antigen of choice to target. And it's a receptor. So that recognize the antigen and activate the T cell for killing. So thoroughly, this is what it looks like. Three domains. The domain that is outside of the cell is the antigen recognition domain. There's a transmembrane domain that anchors this antenna onto the cell. And the intracellular signaling domain, where what happens is when it binds, it's like a firing pin in a gun. It triggers off the cell to engage and kill the cancer. So that's exactly what you know the car looks like. So when we mount the car onto the T cell, the car will recognize the tumor associated antigen and release cytotoxic chemicals to kill off the cells. And since the discovery or since the manufacturing, first 
iteration of car, there are now many iterations of car design to overcome challenges in the two micro environment. We've talked about first gen, second gen, third gen, fourth generation, even fifth generation of cars. Each of them have its own unique capabilities. are FDA approved car therapies that you see here. However, you will notice that all of them are actually autologous in nature and all of them target blood disorders. So because it's autologous, there is very high cost involved in manufacturing and get, having the patients to receive them. And they can only target very narrow in, uh, antigen and very narrow bands of leukemia. So meaning that you there is the candidate for targeting solid tumor is actually out there and we are not able to effectively target solid tumors based on the current approved therapy so far. Like I said, currently we are look, we are looking at autologous therapy at the moment where it's personalized in the future. We will want to move into allogenic therapy or off-the-shelf therapy where we can take blood from a healthy, unrelated donor, manufacture multiple doses, and we can dose it for many different patients so as to reduce the wait time. And because of the possibility of scaling up, you will be able to significantly reduce the cost of manufacturing. And this hopefully could be transferred onto the patient to enable them to access for the masses. Because of this, for gamma delta T cells, there are allogenic ex vivo expanded car gamma delta T cells in the clinical trial that are going on here that you can see. And these are all very exciting because they now start to target broad range of cancers that you can see here. You can see that there are very interesting clinical readouts that are coming out here. The gamma delta T cells and the car gamma delta T cells have been used to treat late stage cancer patients. Over here, we have a group that treats metastatic lung or liver cancer patients. And you can see that they have very good outcome in terms of survival. And this is for liver cancer patients, significant increase in survival, 23. 23.1 months and 8. versus 8.1 months for control. And for lung cancer patient as well, uh, a difference of 19.1 versus 9.1 months. So allogenic gamma delta T and heart gamma delta T are exhibiting promising outcomes. And we're very excited to look at this as a potential future treatment. The future is pretty bright. For, CAR -T, for T cell therapy, uh, cell therapy, CAR T therapy in general, you can see that there is significant year on year growth in cell therapy, you know, just in the last three years alone, 2020, 21, 22. You can see that all across the board, man, all the cell types are growing, particularly in the CAR T cell space. So this is very exciting. And <clears throat> we are also primed for more therapies to be approved in the recent years. So I've shown this chart as now. Uh, we would like to add in another thing here, which is with the chorus and the editing of the gamma delta T cell, we really start to see that the gamma delta T cell as a potential very good candidate for off-the-shelf cancer immunotherapy, particularly in targeting blood and solid tumors. So the future of, cancer, of using <clears throat> cell therapy, potentially we can use gene editing as a tool to further enhance cell performance and efficacy, targeted gene editing, cars, we armor them, and it can perform much better even in stressful tumor microenvironment. We can look into viral versus non-viral gene delivery. And, and all of this will be done in the allogenic setting. So that the starting material will be much better. Also, we can look into new sources of cells as induced pluripotent stem cell, which is a man-made embryonic stem cell. 
so you do not have ethical concerns surrounding embryonic stem cells. So for us, we also have an allogenic pipeline for blood and solid tumors into the car gamma delta T cells, expanded allogenic unmodified gamma delta T cells, and even IPSC derived breed gamma delta NK T cells that we are pushing forward to do clinical development. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And for more information, please visit our website. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter for the latest update as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan, for the very insightful and informative presentation. I'm sure all of you have enjoyed and learned a lot about immune cell therapies. So thank you for those who have posted questions. If you have more questions, this is the time now. The next 20 minutes or so, we will have our Q&A session. Uh, I'll start off with our first question, but please keep the questions coming in. The first question is from Mr. Jensen Ang. Will this type of therapy be helpful for UC, ulcerative colitis? So I'll, I'll take that. Um, immune cell therapy for cancers is our topic for tonight. So gamma delta T cells typically... We are now, uh, as Dr. Tan has explained, this is uh, a therapy that we are focusing on cancers. For ulcerative colitis, this is actually an autoimmune disease, not a cancer. Um, for autoimmune disorders, we have found that another type of cell therapy, mesenchymal stem cells, are quite useful in um, attenuating the autoimmune response, similar to... Uh, COVID patients who have very bad inflammatory flares during the COVID-19 pandemic. There were a lot of studies surrounding the use of mesenchymal stem cells to um, help patients recover faster. So mesenchymal stem cells therapy might be something useful. You're thinking about cellular therapeutics, but that's another topic. Um, our focus tonight will be on cancer therapeutics using immune cell therapy rather than mesenchymal stem cells. But Mr. Jensen and anyone uh, else in the audience who's keen to know more about mesenchymal stem cell therapy, you can feel free to leave us your contact uh, details, your name, your email, or you can come onto our website, as Dr. Tan has mentioned, www.cytomat.sg. Drop us an email and we will get back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, great. Okay, so next question. How about recurrent cancer treatment. Can I invite Dr. To to answer that? Will immune cell therapy be useful for recurrent cancer treatment? Uh, actually, we have been uh, keeping in mind uh, immune cell therapy as a reserve weapon against uh, recurring cancers, meaning that those cancers where the patient have uh, become uh, sort of uh, resistant or uh, not uh, or refractory or not responding to any uh, other modality, uh, modalities of treatment, we uh, uh, reserve this uh, cellular immune therapy uh, for them. And I think there uh, have been a few patients in our list of uh, you know uh, uh, therapies that we have extended this treatment to where the patients have found to be uh, showing a very encouraging response. I wouldn't use the word like going into a remission or to uh, be, uh, you know, a cure of the cancers, but it is a very good uh, sort of, uh, you know, no options left for them, a kind of uh, sort of a salvage or, uh, you know, second hope uh, therapy. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Dr. To. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Luis. Cell therapeutics, cellular therapeutics are very new domain. And as Dr. To mentioned, this has been reserved as last stage or salvage treatment at the moment. So the recurrent or patients who are not responding to first-line therapies or who have relapsed or have uh, cancers coming back again after initial therapy, these are the patients who are actually looking for cellular therapies at the moment against their cancers. However, there is there are more and more oncologists because CAR-T therapy has been approved for more than five years now. 
The US FDA has approved about five different types of CAR T therapy, mainly against, actually all against hematological cancers. What Cytomed is hoping to do is that uh, we hope we can also target solid cancers on top of blood cancers. But for the approved hematological, uh, uh, approved CAR T therapies against hematological cancers, um, a lot of them are coming for cellular therapeutics only at a very late stage. However, like I said, it's been in play for many, many years now. And more and more oncologists and hematologists are getting comfortable with the idea of considering cell therapy as even a first-line option. I think Dr. Toh would agree as well because uh, when you undergo cancer already or you wait until the very last stage, you might have already missed the optimum period or window for therapy. And even the best medication in the world may not be able to uh, nurse you back to health. So we have, when we have such a potent weapon, and as we get more familiar with it, more oncologists are hoping that we can use this as first-line therapy when your immune system is still naive to chemo. So the chemo has not depleted your immune system. You are still robust and strong enough, hopefully at an earlier stage. And in due time, uh, we hope that this can be early stage treatment rather than reserved to end stage as it is at the moment. Uh, I would um, like to say something. Yes, Dr. Toh. Human malignancies. Uh, Dr. Tan has dealt at length with the uh, B cell uh, uh, malignancies, but uh, there was an article that came out recently on the T cell leukemias, which caught my eye. And this is only a very small uh, series, just about three patients reported on by the uh, doctors at Great Ormond Street in London. And they were talking about T cell leukemias. And it was a very elegant study because instead of using the CRS, BRCAS uh, to cleave the cells, to engineer the cells, they look at, uh, you know, uh, silencing the CD7, CD52, and the B uh, component of the uh, alpha beta cells. And then in the study, they found that there was good response. In fact, there was a great, uh, uh, there was a lengthy, uh, editorial by Longo, who uh, commented on how this came about, and uh, this encouraged the uh, authors to say that they would like to extend the phase one study to more patients and then to evaluate. Now, what they did was they found that by silencing a, a, a CD7, CD52, they avoided uh, graft versus host disease and all those things and rejection. But CD7 is a very uh, you know, unique thing because a lot of the T cells, besides the leukemic T cells, the normal lineage T cells also uh, exhibit the CD7. And some of these uh, T cells, which uh, you know, uh, show a phenomenon of what they call fratricide, they kill their brothers so that they will not be killed by themselves by the anti-tumor effect uh, of the T cells. So it is a very, very uh, elegant paper. Lots of things to learn from this uh, paper. And it just came in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine, uh, September 7th. Do read it because I recommend it highly. Right. Thank you, Dr. Toh. So what is coming up for Cytomed? When will we start clinical trials? Uh, in fact, we have a clinical trial, a phase one first in human clinical trial using our uh, patented CAR gamma delta T cells against both solid and hematological malignancies. This is a clinical trial that uh, we have received full approval from the Health Science Authority Singapore, HSA, and uh, we are collaborating with the National University Hospital Singapore, NUHS, as well as NCCS, National Cancer Center Singapore, in um, carrying out this trial. So we are in the midst of donor recruitment and will be uh, commencing with the treatment of our patients, uh, recipient uh, therapy, hopefully by fourth quarter of this year. So that is a question from anonymous attendee. Um, we've got a question from Darren Evans. Uh, can you please provide the reference for the studies with graphs shown on page 28? So, uh, Mr. Darren, if you can share with us your contact details, we will share these references uh, with you personally later on. So, uh, we have another question, uh, another 
um, uh, attendee who's also asked for some references. So those of you who are keen, please leave your full contact details, including your name and your email. We will get back to you with the information that you seek later. From Mr. Freeman Pang, what is the expected cost of such cell treatment? Dr. Tan, Wicked, would you like to answer this question? Expected right. cost of cell therapy. Right, thank you, Lucas. So, right now, cell therapy, as we know, especially for those that's been approved, we are looking at uh, hundreds of thousands, same dollars, all the way to half a million US dollars, which is six, seven hundred thousand, uh, same dollars. The cost of the therapy is expensive, like I said, because of the manufacturing and all that. Right now, while we do not have a number for it, we are hoping that it's going to be significantly affordable simply because by being able to scale up, we will want to transfer the cost of the savings to the patient so that to make it affordable to the masses. So it will be significantly cheaper than what is currently being offered right now. That will be our aim. Another question, anonymous attendee. As doctors, are you encouraged by what we have seen in Cytomed? Well, definitely. And uh, just to share, uh, in our phase one clinical trial with NUHS and NCCS, we have a team of more than 30 oncologists and hematologists who have been very excited to join us on this trial as well. So it just goes to show uh, what keen interest there is in terms of uh, engaging the use of uh, cytomat cellular therapeutics against cancers, both solid and hematological. So uh, I hope that answers your question. And we hope that we can soon um, share more results as we get uh, our recipients in to receive the immune cell therapy in our Angelica study. Okay, next from um, Luis again. How serious is the side effect using gamma delta T cells versus alpha beta T cells treatment? Can I invite Dr. To to answer this question again? Gamma delta T cells versus alpha beta T cells in terms of side effect. I think the side effects are normally uh, reported in using cellular therapy is the cytokine uh, response. And uh, this can be easily dealt with uh, in, all, in uh, any patient who shows a cytokine response. There are other toxicities, which is uh, things like you know, effector cell uh, driven um, uh, neuropathies and things like that, you see. And also sort of a depletion of the lymphocytic cells in the recipient. But uh, in the case of uh, using uh, allogenic uh, uh, gamma delta T cells or R T cells, we are uh, uh, doing away with the uh, HLA discrepancies so that uh, it is uh, 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 shaped better than using the alpha beta, which is uh, totally autologous. And of course, uh, you know, uh, using autologous in the case of a hematological malignancy is not good because you are using cells which have been uh, sort of subjected to a lot of uh, damage by, you know, chemotherapy and disease itself. Whereas, uh, you know, in the case of the allogenic, you bypass all this and you have got one donor who donates 400 ml of blood and then you can harvest, say, 20 units of uh, uh, 1 billion cells each. And therefore, you have one donor, uh, one uh, you know, a product serving many patients, many diseases. Right. Thanks, Dr. To. So indeed, also for alpha, beta T cells, the risk of cytokine storm, as Dr. To mentioned, is... Uh, deemed to be a lot higher and the risk of rejection is also a lot higher. Uh, for gamma delta T cells therapy, we envision and theoretically it should be a lot safer. Uh, we are, because of the abundance of caution, this is a first in human trial we're doing it in Singapore at the moment, we are going to be admitting our patients for overnight stays. But in the near future, once we get more safety data, we hope to position this as an outpatient therapy because we feel that this can be very, very safe. Uh, we've got another question from Kelly. 
Is Gamma Delta CAR T treatment available in private oncology clinics in Singapore? And is it helpful for advanced stage colon cancer? So I think I'll answer that. Um, unfortunately, this is still an uh, experimental form of cancer therapeutics. So in Singapore, you can only assess this under the clinical trial that we are commencing with NUHS and NCCS. Once we have more data, we will share with uh, the public. And uh, we hope that cancer patients can be accessing these treatments in future once it's found to be safe and efficacious. However, at the moment, only under clinical trial settings can you assess car gamma delta T cell therapy in Singapore. And colon cancer is actually one of the indications that we're looking at. Dr. Tan also shared earlier on in our presentations in our uh, lab and animal research models, colon cancer was actually one of the cancers that showed very good response when we used this in mice in the lab. Okay, uh, so th there's another question uh, regarding, okay, from Mr. William Lee. On page 29, please show slide again. Uh, Dr. Tan, can you show the slide again? Page 29. What does 1432 records in 2022 mean? How many trials are these records from? And does record mean number of patients? Page 29. What does 1432 records mean? Right, this is actually the, this is the number of records. This is actually the number of trials. If you look at markets, if you look at the legend, marketed phase three, uh, phase three, phase two, phase one, and preclinical, this is the amount of studies that are actually being ran here. So there are thousand over studies that are being ran globally. Yeah, with just a small, well, we see now a small sliver that is being marketed, but it has been growing with increasing accelerated approval throughout the years. So this is, that is why we say that this is something that we are very looking forward because while the first landmark approval was given in 2017, right, and actually there were two given in 2017, we start to see one a year, now we see two a year, so the regulatory understanding of this and the entire framework of it is gaining speed, so we will see more and more now, as you see, more and more there are more and more trials, especially going into phase three and more. Right. Okay. Dr. Lucas, uh, are you are you there? While waiting, I think uh can you all hear me? Yes, Dr. Thor, I can hear you. There may be some slight technical. Uh, While we are waiting, uh, since we have some time, uh, Cytomat, I would like to let uh, you all uh, participants know, uh, since we are going to go into, uh, you know, allogenic uh, CAR T's and, uh, you know, NKT cells, we are trying to recruit people who would like to store their peripheral blood for, you know, uh, use as, uh, you know, starting material for uh, PBMCs. And from this, we hope to derive and engineer cells to become CAR T's as well as uh, gamma delta and gay T cells. Right. Thank you, Dr. To. Uh, Lucas, uh, are you back on? Yes, I'm so, back. Yes, sorry. There were some you? issues with my uh, co uh, internet connection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, I believe, is what is the cell therapy efficacy on advanced cancers? Any options for clinical trial in Singapore? Um, what is the cell therapy efficacy on advanced cancers? I think Dr. Tan has shared there's a lot of promising data out there for cell therapies against cancers. We have a lot of information pertaining to hematological cancers where CAR T cells have 
up to 80% and more efficacy, uh, a remission of five years and counting yeah, for uh, leukemias especially. However, the uh, data on solid cancers is still very scanty and we hope that we'll be able to uh, provide more information in the near future. Any options for clinical trial in Singapore? As we mentioned, we are one of a few companies who are doing cell therapy, clinical trials against cancer in Singapore. If you are keen to uh, engage in any of uh, newer cancer therapeutics, do discuss with your oncologist. Many oncologists are actually within a network of clinical trials they will be aware of and they can recommend to you if they find that it is suitable. Yeah, uh, and just, uh, just to highlight that our trial is also known as the Angelica trial, as in, as in the name Angelica, and it is listed on clinicaltrial.gov. So this is a place of open information that you can refer to to have better understanding of it. So there's another question on therapy costs. I think Dr. Tan has covered this earlier on already. Unfortunately, it's not on the MOHCDL list at the moment. Um, so this, uh, and it's also not available. If it's for solid cancers, it's not available in a private setting. However, if you do have a hematological cancer, uh, there are some indications that um, Singapore has uh, recognized CAR T cell therapy for. You can discuss with your hematologist if um, uh, you would like to find out whether you are suitable uh, for CAR T cell therapy. Okay. Could you kindly provide the reference of the publication from London on September 7 mentioned by Dr. To Ken Kiet? Okay, so Mr. Gerard, if you are keen to uh, get this reference, can you please just leave us your name and email? We will email you the reference for this publication mentioned by Dr. To. And this was uh, September 7 uh, publication, isn't it? Yes. It's the New, Eng New England Journal of Medicine. Yeah, it comes yeah. out week and then you can get it uh, in the September 7th issue. Okay, this is a paper by the uh, Great Ormond Street Group and with an editorial coverage by Longo, L-O-N-G-O. -O. So a question by uh, Pei Yu Lim, for the treatment of solid tumors, do you think gamma delta T cells have better infiltration capabilities than alpha beta T cells? Uh, Dr. Tan? Right. So this, actually, there are studies that have shown that the gamma delta T cell infiltration is better than the gamma delta, sorry, than the alpha beta T cell. And I think the key landmark study that we will refer to is actually the chart that I've shown earlier, whereby the infiltration uh, of gamma delta T cell is actually the top prognostic marker uh, or top prognostic association of better outcome. Uh, and gamma delta T cell, sorry, alpha beta T cell ranks further down the line. So meaning that when the gamma delta T cells are infiltrated, you actually go get much better uh, prognosis or anti-cancer protective effect. So the short answer is yes, they would be much better in the infiltration. Okay, so it's 10.30. We will take just the last question now. Can I know if it's already answered? Other than Singapore clinical trials, are you all doing safety trials in other countries? Uh, we're commencing our first in human phase one trial in Singapore. We hope to be extending this to other countries in uh, multi-center studies in the near future, probably in the next year or two, if uh, things go as planned. Okay. Um, Dr. Tan, Dr. Do, do you think we should call it a night? Are there any burning questions or any comments that anyone would like to raise at this point? Maybe, okay. uh, well, in the interest of time, maybe we could end because it may be late, but uh, we have our, uh, our website here, right? And uh, on our website, there is inquiry at cytomat.sg. If you have any questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to us and you know, we will attend to it. So thank you once again for everyone attending this uh, late evening webinar in Singapore, Malaysia time. If you're in other parts of the world, 
thank you for joining us in the midst of your busy day. We hope that this uh, webinar has been helpful in helping uh, in um, letting you understand a bit better about immune cell therapeutics against cancer. As Dr. Tan mentioned, our website, www.cytomed.sg, there's a button for you to inquire and contact us if there are any further uh, issues you would like to discuss with us. So thank you. Have a pleasant day and wonderful evening for the rest of you who are in Singapore and Malaysia. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. Night.